Hey guys, it's Daniel. Welcome back. The following is my interview with The Killer's recording engineer and mixer, Mark Needham, where he talks about the history of Mr. Brightside, all these things that I've done, Hot Fuss, Brandon Flowers stories, and more. We had mm -hmm. the drums, everybody in the main room with the drum, and Brandon singing in a SM58. The bass and the keys were both direct. We had this this little, uh, that was oh. that was the big sound. <laughs> So what is that exactly for Mr. Brightside? It was a, it's a, it's a bass pod, an old line six bass pod. So that's the, that was the bass. We didn't use a bass amp. We just used that because we didn't have really enough rooms, you know. For I just happened to have this out because we used it on some on another record, but that was the. That's so that so the the keys were direct. The bass was just running to that bass pod. Really? So how come you guys didn't have a bass amp? I mean, you go you go through the work of having the studio. There's no bass amp. Well, we didn't have a lot of ISO boost at the, and we didn't really want it to bass in the room with the drums. So we just, uh, at, at, at that, that studio that we, we were started in San Francisco was pretty small. That's why we ended up coming down to LA, went to my bigger room. For you personally, when you first heard the song, what was your initial reaction to it? Did you think it was something special? I mean, I, we all thought the record sounded really good. I, I, obviously, you know, it'd be great to say, yeah, we knew it was, we knew it was a smash from the beginning, but, you know, um, we, you know, we shopped that record for a year to every major label in the U.S. and, man, Jim, we're hitting, you know, England as well, and we were not met, met with resounding compliments on the record, and nobody liked it. Um, uh, the only, you know, the only label that would sign it was that was uh, Lizard King, which was a small indie in the UK. So, you know, I don't think any of us were really prepared with for the success that it had when it really just blew up so quickly. You know, I remember they started a tour in you in uh, out of Los Angeles right after the band had got picked up by Island, the US, their US label, and there was maybe 250 people at the show and nine months later they came back to town and they were playing to 15,000 people wow. <laughs> and everybody I went in with my assistant and the band started we, we, we were backstage we came back out and they started the first song and like everyone in the audience from you know old men and women the kids everybody knew like the word to every song I didn't know the words to every song on the record <laughs> you know I'm just like like, do they pass out little sheets with all the lyrics? Or what? That's you know? amazing. Was there any one moment that it first hit you guys that, like, oh, my goodness, this has taken off? Was there a moment, or was it just a gradual build? Mr. Brightside really blew up in the U.K., and that's when the majors started to jump in. And, you know, it, it was looking pretty obvious from that point that, you know, it's like, oh, everybody's in a huge bidding war now. This song's number one. On, you know, Radio 1, and, uh, you know, the excitement was definitely in the air. I mean, I, to, to see how quickly it went from, again, from two or 300 people at a club in Los Angeles to, uh, you know, to arenas was, I don't think any of us would have, would have thought that, you know. It's interesting to me, looking back on it, how, 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 long, how well the record has stood up over time. That's awesome, man. So, I mean, in terms of the vocals, I wanted to ask you, at the beginning of the song, it sounds like there's some kind of a filter over Brendan's vocals. Was there something added there, like an effect? Yeah, I would uh, just made kind of a lo-fi thing to that whole, you know, just to that whole intro. The vocals on a lot of those songs, not all of them, but I think that one in particular was just an SM58 handheld in front of the speakers. Hmm. Uh, so it wasn't in headphones and an ISO booth and, you know, we just cranked up the speakers and gave him a mic and had him sing. That's so cool. Would, would Brandon approach doing vocals for the entire Hot Fuss album like that? Or was it specifically just for Mr. Brightside? Uh, it was, it was, there was a lot of the songs on that. I can't remember specifically which ones. Hey, fair enough. So I wanted to ask you about Mr. Brightside. There's a lot of folklore around the making of that song, you know, some people say the original mix is what ended up on the record. Is that true? Like, what's the story behind that all? That's the mix that ended up on the record. I, I actually remixed it on my SSL in L.A. probably 
four times because I'm like, well, I'm not, you know, it's like, I, I, there's things I wasn't super happy with on that mix, you know, but at the time, you know, just overthinking it, but you know, it had, it had the energy, the band loved it. And that's what we ended up using. When you guys were recording that song, was it already known that that was going to be the song from the record or were you guys still not sure what was going to be like the hit, so to speak? Oh, no, we had no idea what was going to be the hit. <laughs> no, there was the first release in the UK is Mr. Brightside. And the flip side was somebody told me when when it was picked up by Island Universal, they brought out somebody told me as the, mm-hmm. as the first single. But Mr. Brightside kind of outperformed everything else mm-hmm. on the record put together. You know? That's amazing. The backstory of the song, it's known that it's its about something in Brendan's personal life. Did Brendan ever talk about anything like that in the studio, or did you guys just only talk about music? We didn't get into the backstory of, uh, of the song, necessarily. I mean, that's always a fun fact to know. It's, to me, I was, I, I'm always kind of focused on what are, you know, what are 10,000 different people going to make of that story, yeah. and how are they going to make it their own? I went to see him at a big festival, and... I went back to talk to the band and Ronnie had kept telling me, All right, but you know, we're, we're going to put you on the side of the stage or you got to stay right there. And I was there to almost the whole show, but when it gets down to your, you know, you're getting down to those last few songs. I usually start working my way to the, <laughs> the back of the crowd. I want to get to my car. Just as I hit the gate, I hear Ronnie, I can hear Ronnie over the PA going, I want to dedicate the song to Mark. Dean. And then, you know, blah, blah, blah. Hey, Mark, where are you? Mark, blah. Uh, come on, here, come on. It's like, oh shit. And then my phone starts ringing, and my wife, and it's my wife. She's going, You asshole. I know you're at the gate, aren't you? And it's like, uh, Man, where are you? You know, it's like, Oh, and I'm sitting at the gate, and I can still hear the PA. It's like, It's too late to turn around and try to make it back to the stage, you know, try to run through 25,000 people. But, you know, um, that was really embarrassing. I had a text from Ronnie after you left, didn't you, asshole? So. <laughs> That's awesome, man. <laughs> I did an interview with a couple of Nirvana's producers, and one of them said that he was actually on tour with his own band when Teen Spirit blew up. And everywhere he was walking around, just Teen Spirit was playing. Like, he wasn't even in North America. He was in Europe. And it's just like every country he went to, oh. he's like, what's going on? Was there a moment like that where it was kind of like Mr. Brightside was kind of just chasing you around and it's like, what's, what's happening? A bit, you know, a song that, you know, 100 million people around the world hear and it brings back that that place in their life, uh, that time in their life when that song came out and it brings back those memories and stuff. To me, it's just, it's all that. That's kind of the high is just being part of that. So one thing I think is interesting that a lot of people aren't aware of is there's actually two versions of the video. There's the one that everyone knows about. It's the one that's like, you know, the Moulin Rouge kind of one. And then there's also the, there's the British version of it which was filmed in new york if i'm not mistaken the british version was actually filmed in america which is kind of interesting why did that new version get done like the moulin rouge version do you know why there that happened i would think that was when after you know again it was signed to lizard king in the uk and that actually stayed with lizard king in the uk they own the license just for uk for a certain amount of years um but Lizard King went to be from being just kind of a pretty obscure label to a pretty massive, you know, to a pretty well known label in the <laughs> UK because they owned they owned Hot Fuss, and that was you know it was turning into just a worldwide smash. But um, so Island had so Island had signed them for the rest of the world, um, and they went back and redid some different mixes of some of the songs. They did their own videos, you know, they, they had their team had their plan. Um, but yeah, there's, so there's different versions of the hot, the uh, Mr. Brightside versions consistent across all of them. Somebody told me there's, uh, there's the, there's the original UK version and then there's the later version um, that, that uh, Mulder mix on that one. Um, so there are some different versions of the of the songs out, out there hmm. from the original UK releases that we did. So the version that's on the Moulin Rouge video is that the one that you did, or is that the one that Alan Mulder 
That would have been Alan, I think, on that one. And yours is the one that's on the original UK release. I would think I'd have to. I don't. I don't know that I've seen the UK release, but if it was if it was a UK release, it might have been. Then it might have been that one. It depends when it was done. Gotcha. Yeah. The the UK video is essentially it's like a black and white video more or less. Not like there's a tint of color on it, but it's uh, just the band performing. That's basically what the video is. It's nothing particularly. Oh, that might be crazy. that might be the original version that came out. Because it was already released in the UK uh, before Island came in and did did took did the rest of the world. So yeah, because it was it came out on a yeah it was it was a that was the first release in the UK was Mr. Brightside and somebody Mr. Brightside was a single somebody told me it was uh, was the B side was on I have the forty five. That's so cool. Single. That's awesome, yeah. man. So now just to be clear, when we say that there's your version and then there's Alan Mulder's version. Both of them, you were part of the recording team. So even though there's an Alan Mulder oh, yeah, mix, yeah. you're still on yeah. both songs, basically. Yeah. yeah, I'm pretty sure we recorded, re-recorded some additional guitars and keyboards and stuff in Los Angeles. So the versions are probably slightly different. Instrumentally. Oh, okay. Interesting. But you were still involved with both of that. If that, if that oh, yeah, that, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah cool. we just, Alan uh, 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 did mixes. For I, when Island took over, the, the, Alan and the uh, and the A and R guy had a relationship together, so they tried did some stuff. He tried to he tried to remix. I tried to remix Mister Brightside three or four times. He spent three days trying to remix Mister Brightside. Hmm. He spent three days on the one song and went. I just he threw in the towel. <laughs> <laughs> so one thing that's one thing I like about the Mister Brightside song, it's uh, right after the chorus. I don't even know which instrument it is. It's like, because I'm Mr. Brightside, and then it goes like, da, 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 da. like, what is that? Is, is that the guitar? Like, what is that creating that sound? You know what I'm referring uh, to? I think that's the Nord synth there. It might be the Nord and the guitar together. Okay. When we first started that project, I'd help. So we had a studio up in San Francisco that we record, started the recording with the band mm -hmm. um, up there. I was working on a Fleetwood Mac record in LA and, I drove back up to San Francisco. They were just starting on Mr. Brightside. It was everybody was was playing live in the room and they had, you know, done a few takes of the song. We picked out one we liked. We did did a few vocal overdubs on that. And then I just asked the band to give me a half an hour I wanted to do or an hour to give me I just wanted to do some edits some comps of the stuff and uh, edit the arrangement a little bit and set up a rough mix, um, which we really, I didn't really have much to mix on. I had a little late input console and just the basic Pro Tools plugins, Echo Farm, you know, things mm. like that. When you were recording the song, was that the first time you heard it or did you already hear a demo version of it prior to actually working on the recording? I'd, I'd heard demo versions and we'd seen the band live as well to put but you know when they were playing all those songs a lot of artists when they have a song that big they say that they get sick of hearing it themselves right have you ever had that feeling with that song like you just get sick of it or do you just not get tired of hearing it uh i don't get tired of hearing songs that i work on yeah no i, I love that the people are just especially playing a song that i did like in 2000 four or so you know it's almost 20 years 20 years ago i mean i think it's it's kind of fun so i mean if i may ask what's that like for you personally when you know you're walking through a mall and you just hear it casually playing in the background what is that like for you oh it's great you know i mean i love to see it at live shows because the band opens with it now you know just to see the crowd go wild or i've been at other shows where the crowd just started singing the song spontaneously you know oh, that yeah, that's like, cool. oh, wow that's kind of fun you know <laughs> so i want to go back for a sec to what you were saying about the bass how it was recorded direct instead of with an amplifier what did you think of the bass sound the bass sound came out awesome on that you know this bass had a little bass pod worked out great you know i mean that's that has a particular sound distorted sound that worked on that it really just worked on Mark's bass. It's you know, I mean that. Hey, you know, if it if it works, whatever. A billion and a half streams later, that bass pod worked out okay. Yeah, I say yeah. I say it did all right. <laughs> so I mean, would you record the entire record, the like Mark's <clears throat> bass, through that? When we moved down to the Los Angeles 
stopped then. I had a bunch of, I had a, a fairly large room with a lot of ISO booths. So we had an amp and the bass pod. So I might, so, you know, song by song, I might have used more amps, some of the bass pod, you know, depending on if it was just stuff that was done in LA or in, uh, in San Francisco. And then there was, there was one song, and I just can't remember the name of it. There's one that has the super fuzzed out bass on it, and and I made like some weird program drums. I chopped up Ronnie's drums. I can't remember which song it is now, but on that one I had another, this another cut, another like kind of homemade fuzz pedal that we just ran the bass to, where it was just like totally distorted. I can't remember which song it is. Now. But, uh, so, I mean, you know, from your experience, what was the creative dynamic like in the band at the time? Was there any one person really in charge or was were the creative decisions more spread out? It was it was pretty spread out with everybody in the band. Uh, you know, I, 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 everybody had their opinion and but 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 they really worked as a you know, they really worked as a band rather than there's one guy's vision. You know, that that that, that was not the case. That's cool. And so, I mean, on technically, like when they were recording songs, were they recording them in isolation in the studio or did they record them as an ensemble? It was as an ensemble, uh, just everybody in the room. You know, we had a, we had a, a bass direct through, uh, actually through this line six. I have it right down here under my console. Oh, that's cool. Uh, and uh, guitar amp direct keys and a vocal. Later we moved um from the studio in san francisco down to my studio in los angeles to, to do some more songs to, to finish up the record and go back and redo some of the some of the stuff that we'd first done in san francisco um and that was a bigger room but everybody still played live you know there was a little more focus on overdubs at that uh, when we got to la so in general what was the process like for making hot fuss for you like was there like more specifically, like did you have to do a lot of takes with them or were they quick to get their takes down and stuff? They were fairly quick to get their takes down. I mean, I was still in the middle of a, you know, when, I, when we brought them back down to LA to my room, mm -hmm. I was I was mixing a Fleetwood Mac record in the control room, That's cool. which is how I got to, you know, I, could, I, I had the studio open as well. So mm -hmm. I put, we built a little, ISO booth and put Jeff out there with a with a small knee console. So he was actually in the room that built into a little booth and the band was around him playing. Cool. So they would do a bunch of takes and then and then I would listen to stuff, you know, would come in and, and maybe try some arrangement changes or this or that and maybe do some over. And then in, in late afternoon when I was finished with the Fleetwood Mac thing, I was doing that by myself. But as soon as I got free with that, then we would come in and do overdubs in the evening and yeah. work on arrangement changes. You were the main mixer, but you also helped out with the actual recording too. Is this correct? That's correct, yeah. So I want to ask you something about Brandon in, in the studio. Some of the producers I talked to say that the vocalists they work with, they'll go for like 20 minutes, half an hour, take a break, 20 minutes, half an hour, and just it goes like that. Some vocalists will go for like two hours straight and they're still good to go. With Brandon, how did you guys approach recording his vocals like within that context? You know, when we first started, it was just kind of song by song. Okay. So we were doing it. We'd finish the song. We'd do the vocals on it. So it was obviously a break in there. I do remember we did some pretty long. We I do remember some pretty long sessions, him doing vocals. Um, yeah, that's, you know, usually usually when I'm doing that, I, I'll have a singer at the max. I'll have somebody sing for you know, a couple of hours or something because, you know, two hours of singing, that's like, that's a really long show. I wanted to be able to sing the next day, mm -hmm. but I know singers that can come in and sing. I've worked with that can come in and do vocals for six hours straight and come back the next day and do vocals for six hours straight. So I, I don't remember any incredibly long. I do remember we were getting down to the wire that we did some longer vocal sessions, but I don't have any, I don't remember specifically ever running into with his voice getting tired or anything. That's cool. You know, considering this was Brandon's first professional recording, did he know what he was doing in the studio or did you kind of have to direct him and tell him what to do? No, I mean, he was just, you know, we wanted him to, to really sing with believability, I think, which is why we tried, we switched from a 
headphones and a mic to the 58 in front of the speakers on some of the songs. But from the very first time I heard him on stage, he's one of those guys who just just delivered complete believability to me, you know, and his mm-hmm. lyrically and and his vocal delivery. So, I mean, I, you know, I, I, he was... You know, I mean, we had we had problems. We talked with him about on stage because they were all like super stiff on on stage. You know, I mean, for it, for, for the first year, they were they were, you know, <laughs> you look like you're in the headlights on stage a bit. But you know, but that's something you just got to do. You know, after a hundred shows, you start to feel comfortable. After five hundred, you start to look like more like a professional. You know, that's cool. So, I mean, in general, how did Brendan Flowers approach recording vocals? Was there anything unique about his approach in studio? I don't think there was anything that unique about it at that time. I mean, he hadn't really spent that much time in a studio. So I think he was just kind of doing what we said. So, I mean, would you guys double his vocals a lot? Or or is the stuff that we're hearing on the record, is it like single track? Mostly, mostly single track. There are some, there are some soft doubles. There's, there's a... Uh, old Pro Tools plug-in across almost every song on that record that's was Echo Farm. It was like a one of the first like a first little slap delay program. And there was the first preset with, when you open it was this green kind of uh, delay pedal that has I think it's like we, I think it default is 86 milliseconds or something and it has a little distortion kind of just built into the sound hmm. and that's that's really the heart of the vocal sound on that record it kind of got used on Mr. Brightside and then it just sort of made its appearance on a lot of the other songs not, not all of them but but it definitely made an appearance on quite a few of the other ones so, you know, when it comes to Mr. Brightside, arguably the most iconic part of that song is the guitar riff. How did you guys get that guitar tone? It's such a distinct tone. Gosh, I'm trying to remember the name of the amplifier we use. We were just talking about it the other day. They have a reissue of it out now. My mind's just going no, blank. I'll I'll remember it and say, oh, Supro. It was an old Supro amp. Everything came together pretty quickly obviously there was a there was changes and the lyric changes melodic changes arrangement changes and stuff but i don't i don't remember any song that was like and some we took quite a bit you know like we really took a right and we took a, a heavy right and changed it quite a bit but um i don't remember any of them not coming together fairly easily the drums and bass are really are really driving on most of those tracks um, super busy bass part. Ronnie's really busy. The guitars are, the guitar parts are usually these high kind of soaring psychedelic lines, and there's a few keyboards to come in. There's really not a lot going on, so the, the things that are there sound really big. Um, mm-hmm. So I, I, I think that's also part of the magic of that. There, there wasn't 150 tracks with a lot of, you know. 25 keyboard pads all going through you know it's just it's it's drums you know generally it's super active drums bass and a high psychedelic guitar line and sometimes and sometimes either keep keyboard uh, one keyboard pad or or a big keyboard line i think is is more is generally what happens on those and the lead vocals so so i interviewed one of metallica's producers a little while back and he said that when he recorded Lars's drums, they recorded it in a parking lot, basically, because of like they, it had this interesting sound. When you were recording the band for Hot Fuss, was there anything experimental you did in terms of how you approached recording them, or was everything pretty standard, more or less? I mean, it was pretty standard. We had a real, kind of a small, super live room in the, our, the studio in San Francisco, and there's always something still great about just getting four guys, you know, four people in the room and play the song, Some, you know, with the, with the icon, you know, if you're, if you're eight feet apart from each other, they got the visual contact and, uh, you know, sometimes you just get that magic that happens when a band's just together playing live in the studio. I, I think, again, that's something that le- that added to the believability factor of those songs in that record. 
That's so cool. So one thing I want to clarify is you mentioned that there's the LA studio and the San Francisco studio. So what exactly was done in San Fran and what was done in LA? We'd recorded pretty much the whole record up there, but then we'd only released Somebody Told Me and Mr. Brightside were the only ones that were had been released in the UK through Lizard King. Um, and I think it was when Island was starting to jump in, that Mr. Brightside was blowing up that we came back down to my LA studio and set up retract, added some tracks to a bunch of the songs, retract several of the songs. I think that's how the how the timeline went. It's been a while. Yeah, no, for it's sure. been a lot it's been a lot of bands ago, you know? Yeah. So basically more so so overall, the vast majority of the record was done in San Francisco. Lizard King, the indie label in the UK released it, and then afterwards when it was successful, you started retouching it in LA. Is that more or less what happened? I think that's how my, I think that's how the timeline went. We might have come down, you know. After it was, I thought it was after those two were being released that we'd come down to uh, San Francisco to, to Los Angeles, and we worked for probably another month in my studio. I had two two studios there, so we had, but I had I had put them out in my big tracking. In my main tracking room, I was I was mixing that Fleetwood Mac record, so kind of supervising the recording going on there, and then mm. working with the band when I finished the Fleetwood Mac stuff. So it was a very hectic time. So it's kind of hard to remember all of the uh, all of the specific dates on it at this point. You know, I was working on so many projects at, at that time. Hey, it, I usually am working on too many projects at once, but. Yeah, it's all good, man. It's all good. So I want to ask you about a couple of particular songs, aside from Mr. Brightside, if that's cool with you. So, I mean, the other big track from that record, of course, is Somebody Told Me. At the beginning of Somebody Told Me, there's there's these kind of like like electronic like, like sounds. Like, how did you guys get that exactly? That's all stuff from the Nord keyboard. Okay. That was, uh, that was Brandon just making it on that one, as I remember, yeah. That's cool. And you mentioned that for Mr. Brightside, you put that kind of lo-fi filter on Brendan's vocals for the intro. Was it the same kind of filter you did at the beginning of Somebody Told Me? Because it's it has a similar quality to it, his vocal. Uh, same kind of thing. Yeah, same concept, slightly different approach. The, uh, the one on Mr. Brightside, the drums are all filtered at the intro of Mr. Brightside as well and distorted in mono. And then when the band kicks in, it goes, it spreads out stereo. So it's a little bit different slightly different but same same concept slightly different approach i know we redid a bunch of stuff on that one when we got to los angeles i know we i remember we recorded re-recorded i thought a bunch of guitar parts on that there was a version of that out because i didn't actually mix somebody told me on the island release that's uh, alan Mulder on that one um, cause I, I had brought on Alan to remix some of the songs, to do mixes on some of the songs. There was a version out, um, the first, again, the flip side of Mr. Brightside was, would it would have been the original version. That was the original version and mix before we brought it back and did more overdubs. Okay. Um, beyond that, I, I don't remember specific things on that song. All good, man. All good. So how about all these things that I've done? Do you remember working on that track? I, I do remember. I do remember on that track specifically, I remember bringing in the gospel choir. Um, cool. We brought in that choir and I brought them over to, uh, I brought the band and the choir over to another studio I had in San Francisco. Uh, it was Studio 880 at the time that I had a room in. Just getting the gospel choir in there and they're all in the control room kind of working out the parts and and saying and, and you know we're just all just like oh my this is you know because you that's that section you get to you get to that section in the song and it light in the live shows and you know it's just a magic part of that song but 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 hearing this choir in there you're live with us in the control room i had a show with the with i went to with the band at south by southwest which was okay. going to be there they'd signed to island but the record hadn't come out yet. Um, this is all regarding that song. Okay. The label was going to fly out and 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 see him because they were kind of thinking there was some talk that maybe they were going to drop him. 
Hmm. Um, so we, 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 I was with, with Braden Merrick. We were at, we were at the, the, the show at South by and we went, we got to get a gospel choir on stage for, you know, for all these things we, we you know, we got to make that, this, we have to make that this big moment. So we're calling around, trying to find it. We're, we're in Austin, trying to call calling around the day of the, you know, like hours before the show, trying to find a gospel choir. We finally got one. It's like, I think it's literally maybe 30 minutes before the band goes on stage. Huh. And I had the gospel choir back. I had the song up on my phone and I've, I've got the choir back in the dressing room. The band's already starting to play on stage. And I'm like trying to show them the parts, you know, what all the parts are. Um, and we had just finished just really finished going through the part and it's coming up on the, you know, here's the show. Okay. We walk them up to the front. They all come out on stage and, and sing that part on the, you know, they, they came, came out of the off backstage and started singing that part of the song. It was just like such a high moment in the show that, 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 that definitely sold the label on it. That's awesome. So where did you find that band? I mean, where did you find the gospel choir? We just started calling around to churches, you know, bringing a higher post. It's like, we got to find a gospel choir. I don't know. It's a, you know, it's like, we got an hour till the show. Get it, you know, you guys got a choir? You want to make some money? Yeah. <laughs> That's amazing. Are there any recordings of that performance available anywhere? Do you know? There aren't any recordings of that that I know of. There is a, there is a live version of, Hot Fuss that was recorded in at oh the House of Blues I think in maybe in one of the ones in Florida or something. It's just kind of uh, it's I think it was probably that's when the but before the band had really was playing in bigger venues. So uh, you know it's probably four or five hundred people or something, and there was a live recording of that, which I still have. I still have sitting on a shelf in my studio in L.A. I've tried, you know, I've asked him, I've, I've, I've talked to the band about, you yeah, guys should release this. <laughs> so going back to the South by Southwest show and the gospel choir, what did the choir think when you brought them in? Was it a professional choir or a local church choir you just found somewhere? It was a church choir. That we That's found, cool. Yeah. So were they nervous at all? Like, is this something they've done before? Well, certainly not just learning the song and walking out and saying, I don't know that they'd ever really, I mean, I, I don't know if they'd ever with a rock band or not before you know but uh they didn't have a lot of time to get nervous because i just finished showing them the parts and break because i hey, just got kind of time to go time to go time to go you know they re- and just walk them out and they just, you know they could they come out ha- at the halfway point of that song they just walk out because the song was already starting to play you know it's like all right here we go how many people was the choir consisting of there was had to be at least probably 15 or something. 15 uh, people. So you just, you just recruited 15 people like right before the show, taught them the stuff and they nailed it. That's a great story. <laughs> you know, but it, you know, that was the big finale. And when they, when the gospel choir walked out, they started singing like that. I got sold, but you know, I'm not, I'm not a soldier. It was like the crowd just went crazy. It was, you know, that's um, amazing. I'm glad B- B- Braden pushed that because it was like, you know, it was, it, it really just made the end of that show. It, cool. You know, it really left it on a high point. And those, who, and for those who aren't familiar, who is Braden in this story exactly? He was one of our one of the original partners of the three of us, um, who decided, you know, put we just put the company together, just to sign three bands and develop them, see where it went. Um, he had a he was the manager for. I don't know, through maybe up to Sam's town or something. So, I mean, if I may ask, why not bring the, I'm sure logistically this is probably the reason, but why not bring the choir that recorded on the record to the show in South by Southwest? Yeah, it would have been expensive. That was a, that was a fairly big, well-known gospel choir as well. Hmm. Um, so, you know, they would, they, I mean, they have a lot of performances. They're a really well-known gospel choir. Was there a demo of this song that you heard before recording it in the studio? I don't remember hearing a demo of all these things, no. Okay. Because I was going to ask you, if there was a demo, was there a choir on the demo? So I guess the oh, question... No. Yeah, okay. So but, I guess the question yeah. would then be, whose idea was the choir? Was it like any one particular person came up with the idea? I 
I can't remember if that was Brandon who asked me about a choir. I, I I knew a bunch of big gospel choirs in in the Bay Area, and also I have some some in LA that I that I work with a lot. So um, I have children's choirs, gospel choir, you know, because sometimes those I choirs, choirs. Are just, <laughs> like I, you know. But uh, I can't I can't remember if Brandon asked me about it. But I went, oh, I got I got a choir for you, and I brought I brought this choir in. Um, I remember I had to bring one in. I had to find one at the last minute for the Kimmel show. I think it was the Kimmel show. Mm -hmm. well, they were in LA doing a TV show. And again, I got that call. It's not an hour before, but <laughs> not that much lead time. Mark, you know, like, like I'm the choir guy, you know, <laughs> I think we need a choir on TV too. All right, I got a choir for you. <laughs> so when it came to Hot Fuss, were there any other songs where you guys were thinking of adding a choir to, or was it just all these things I've done? Just that one song. So, I mean, when you're recording a choir, how do you, like, line them up in the studio? Do they all have their own individual mics, or is there one mic in the middle and everyone's around it? On that particular one, I think I just used, like, three, maybe three mics across the front. Hmm. I didn't do any, I didn't really do any separate mics or just in the room. One thing I'm curious about is, you know, when you're like for a lot of, for those who are, might not be familiar technically, when you record a vocalist, sometimes you can record them multiple times and add that together. That's called doubling. When you record a choir, because there are already so many voices, do you ever double that or is it sufficient on its own? Sometimes I double it. Yeah. Uh, you know, it depends how big the choir is too. Sometimes they'll maybe just send eight people down. And they'll stack part, you know, they'll stack different parts to even get bigger harmonies or, you know, yeah. I mean, sometimes I'll try to make it into a gigantic choir. You know, I guess it depends on what the, what the song calls for, you know, That's it's cool. all kind of just no rules. It's just kind of song dependent, you know? Yeah. So for that song, all these things I've done, was it doubled or was it just a single track? That was just the one pass. That's cool. And including all the little the little high ad libs and stuff, I think. Oh, maybe we we might have overdubbed the ad libs. I take that back. We did overdub the ad libs. In general, was there a lot of ad libbing with the recording of Hot Fuss, or was it mostly what was planned? They just did that. Well, I mean, uh, yeah, the ad libs with the choir were just you know them just kind of going off with those high gospel. I mean, there's, but certainly, I mean, every time you get in the studio. You try to make, you make a plan, you go on with a plan mm -hmm. and the plan, you know, it's like, it's like a battle or something, you know, mm -hmm. you go in with your battle plan and, and all of a sudden you're off some completely different direction. You, tr I mean, you try to make the best plans, the most organized plans you, you can going in, but sometimes songs just, you know, you start, oh, well, let's try this, let's try this, let's try this. And all of a sudden you're in a completely different place with the song that happened with a few of them. Um, but that, that's, that's just the normal, that's the normal course of making a record, you know, mm -hmm. to, to, you start to develop a song and all of a sudden you, you just, Oh, well, we could take it here. We could take it here. We could take it here. And it's all of a sudden it's over, you know, it's 20 miles from where you started, but it's cool. You know, sometimes it's 20 miles from where you started and it's worse. <laughs> um, and you go back and start over. When it came to Mr. Brightside, was it, was it like one of those or was it more or less what you planned to record? You got it. That was fairly close. I changed some of the, I changed some of the arrangement around. That was part of my hour was, you know, I spent a half hour chopping some of the arrangement around and, doing some stuff and then my my 30 minutes for my mix um i can't remember the exact cuts i made i'd have to go back and look at the files again but um so i did make some arrangement changes on that so it stuck and that's history you know <laughs> 20 years later mr brightside remains one of the biggest songs in the world why do you think that song is so endearing to so many people the thing that really made that record stand out and and generally holds true for, for 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 a lot of records that really stand the test of time, twenty years later, there's you know still on a chart now and then, and um, is is the lyrics and the believability of the delivery of those lyrics, and you know the 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 lyrics in Mr. Brightside are so clever, and you know he delivers the story with such believability, and it's just you know 
I mean, again, I, I watched 20,000 people just start spontaneously singing the song and they all have made this their story or something. And that's, to me, that's what makes a song that really lasts. One of the things that I've enjoyed talking to producers about and producers, mixers, et cetera, are like kind of the funny stories in the background. Were there any like funny stories from your time with the band that you'd be able to recall? I was I, I was trying to remember a funny story. I mean, the only one that that came to mind right off the bat was when he when they came down to L.A. and and we started to finish up the record down there. And uh, I we just hired two new assist. I had a studio manager just hired two new assistants, and obviously given the given them the speech about being attentive to the band and um I, we were working and finally brandon came up to me i guess i hadn't really been paying attention which i should have been <laughs> again but you know mark like why is this this guy's like just stares at me he's i constantly and he follows me around so i started watching and the assistant is literally he has he had kind of he's one of those guys that had kind of really big eyes <laughs> Maybe like the eyes really wide open and like too wide open. <laughs> and he was literally just following Brandon like a puppy dog, like everywhere he went, he would, you know, like the only way he could get away from the guy was to go in the bathroom. So I finally had to take him aside and say, dude, you, you have to go home. And there's some like, you're, you know, you're scared. Yeah. I mean, it's not like you're bothering, you're scaring Brandon, you know, it's like, this is, especially with the eye thing, eh? Cause he looked like he might be a, a psycho killer a little bit with the, with the super wide eye. So I had to kind of escort him out and, and not try to nicely tell him, I just, 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 this is not going to work. You know, this is day one and you've already got the lead singer scared, you know? Was there something behind that or was the guy just, that was just the way he was? That was just the way he was. And I think he was probably trying to do a good job and be a super attentive, but uh, I, I don't think he understood what, what that meant, you know? <laughs> so going back to your other funny story about the concert where they dedicated Mr. Brightside to you, but then you left early. Have you or the band ever brought up that story again? I I talked with Ronnie just over text. I did, you know, like, like, where'd you go? Oh, man, it's like the parking lot. I could, you know, Bonnaroo. You get stuck in the middle of that Bonnaroo parking lot. It could take you like three hours to get out. I had to be in the studio the next morning, but I haven't brought it up since. <laughs> <laughs> I, I was hoping that maybe they'll dedicate another song to me while That's I'm hilarious. there. But, you know, I might have blown my big chance. But... Dude, that was it. It's over, man. And it was, it was funny, pa Pauline, it's just like, I'm literally at the gate and I hear that. And then within 20 seconds, Pauline's calling me going, you asshole, you're at the gate, aren't you? You know, yeah, <laughs> I'm just trying to beat the traffic. <laughs> now, here's a question. Did you at least stand there and listen to the song or did you keep going? I stood there for a minute, just panic. Oh, man, I got it. I should try to run back to the crowd or something. Oh, uh, that's not gonna work. I mean, it's literally. I mean, it's like twenty five thousand people. There's like a little quarter I could run off. And once I make it to the, once I make it to the to the to the mixer, there's a little quarter that goes up to the stage. So I can, once I badged it through that, I could have made it back. But just getting to the twenty five thousand people to get there, the twenty thousand people would have been impossible. So I finally just resigned myself and kept walking <laughs> yeah, that's hilarious that makes for a great story and it still took me an hour to get out of the lot you know man it wasn't even worth it you totally blew it <laughs> yeah <laughs> so i mean is is ronnie like the jokester of the band like what's your relationship like with the guys uh you know i still go and you know i i i still go out and see him at shows and stuff and we have well, i mean we have a great relationship still ronnie is yes but R ronnie would be the jokester of the band you know <laughs> They did drag me onto the tour bus once when they were leaving L.A. Somehow they talked me into, I think this was probably Ronnie mostly too, they talked me into jumping on the tour bus and going with them. I think I made it, We let, they left the show in Los Angeles at 3 in the morning. By the time we hit Las Vegas, um, I was like 
what am I doing? I don't want to be on a tour bus. I, after the band was all asleep, I just, I would have tapped the driver. Could you just pull over here and let me out, man? I can't, <laughs> what am I doing? I'm not, I'm not going to get any sleep. I'm not going to, I'll never get any work done. I'm just going to be beat up and tired, follow, you know, hanging with the band here for two weeks on tour. So I, I managed to sneak off the bus too. I texted them later. Sorry guys. I still get along great with the band. I, you know, I, if I'm at, if they're playing a show near me, I'll always go out and catch them. That's awesome. So going back to the making of Hot Fuss, given the fact it was their first professional record, were they nervous at all during the recording process? What was the atmosphere like with the band? I mean, they were like most young bands. I mean, they were, you know, they were excited to succeed and, you know, and they're in their, in a real studio for the first time. It was a, the studio we started in in San Francisco was a small room that we'd built in Jeff's in the basement of Jeff's house. Um, so it wasn't like the big major studio, but you know, they were, they were super, super excited, super nervous, but really pumped to be actually making a record for the first time, you know? And how about you? Like, how did, like, when you first started working with them, what did you think of them as a band? I, I guess I was impressed. And one thing I was look for in, you know, I do a lot of artist development. I've done it for, for years. And one of the things I found most exciting about the band was the believability factor of just the lyrics and the delivery and the delivery of the songs. Live, they were not super exciting at first. That's one thing that turned some of the labels off because they'd been playing in a uh, in a club in Las Vegas who was on this it was on uh, off the strip, but that was kind of their main place they played there and the stage was really small so they didn't really move you know they hadn't been used to working bigger stages and being able to actually move around like like the mark had to play his bass kind of holding it up you know sideways because so they wouldn't bash each other at this club in uh, las vegas that's where we first went to see him the live show as far as movement on stage was still a little stilted but the just the energy level of the of of all the songs and the lyrics and the band was I think what really what really caught people. How did you first meet the killers exactly? Like what was the exact connection with the band? We first met him um Braden had been in contact with him online. We were we were listening through you know, we had a we did a bunch of research and put together a bunch of songs from a bunch of artists, you know, looking for the three that we were going to sign and the killers had made the, you know, had made the cut of those three. And the first time that I met him, we flew down, we flew to Las Vegas to see him playing at that, that little, uh, there was a, like a little club in a strip mall next to the hard rock. Okay. Like it was a little strip mall. There was like a club in the back corner of the strip mall. Okay. Um, and so, yeah, I went there. And that's the first time I met him. We hung out for a while and we watched him play a show. And this is cool. We like this, you know? That's cool. So, but, but how did you hear of the band? Like, how did, like, that, that initial, like, how did you find them? The reason I'm asking is, I mean, this is back in 03, 04, that era. That's, this is before Facebook even. Like, I think the only social media was really MySpace. Like, where where would you find someone online at that time? It was probably on MySpace. Uh, yeah, I mean, it was, um, yeah, because actually, because uh, we did all, we did most of that research online. There were some of the bands we got demos from. There was one of the bands that we signed later to Columbia. Hmm. It was actually a Bay Area band. Um and we'd got just gotten some cassette tapes from them, so we were just gathering a bunch of music and trying to. Uh, but but we did find, if I remember it correctly, and I think I am, we did find them online because we didn't really have any connections in Vegas. But we found these we found these little demos. They're like, oh, this is kind of cool. Who are these guys? You know, that's awesome, man. So, what was your working relationship like with Jeff Saltzman, the producer of the Hot Fuss album? Jeff, my uh, who was my attorney, we were partners in a small studio in San Francisco. Jeff Saltzman and Jeff had got tired of being just the lawyer guy in the in the partnership and wanted to start recording stuff. So that's cool. I showed, sat down and showed Jeff how to run Pro Tools and just the record button and you know <laughs> so 
he was in there w w working with all the super hands on with the band and i would you know i had set up all you know the, the recording the eq the sounds and stuff and they would bring you know they would work on a song bring it in i would make some you know maybe if we, we do try this arrangement or Ginny is a friend of mine you know i remember doing a, some big, pretty big arrangement changes on that um some small ones on mr bright's i don't you know so um so it was kind of a combination of of, of of Jeff and I. So what did you think of the band's follow-up record, Samstown? I don't think you worked on that one, but just what did you think of it? Um, I liked that record. I thought there were some great songs on the record. I went over to visit the guys when they were when they were working on it. It was completely, you know, a lot of bands like to do that make a completely different approach for a, their sophomore record. And um, for a sophomore record, I thought it was, I thought it was really strong. I... I probably wouldn't have done something that was that big and orchestrated and Springsteen-ish sounding, you mm -hmm. know. But I, I thought it, I thought it maybe, maybe took a, a another road that went a, diverted a little too far away from what made the band the simplicity of the really the the four, you know, the just the four guys in the room, um, but. You know they wanted to go another they wanted to you know just spread their wings and fly you know and it's a super strong record some great songs on it i actually did some i can't remember if i did a radio some radio a radio mix on a song on that one i know i did one on uh like spaceman hmm. so i did do some you know i did some stuff for i did some radio stuff for them that they, that we, i think okay. on maybe one song on sam sound and the next one i'm still a bigger fan not just because I worked on it. I'm a bigger fan of Hot Fuss just because of the grittiness and yeah. of it, you know. But bands, bands move, bands get older and move along, you know. Yeah, and yeah. Uh, but you know that the guys have had such a great career. You know, I've, I've, I'm I'm so proud of them that they, you know, I mean they were also. I've got a picture. I don't. Oh, I don't have it here. I have a picture. It's in my other studio in LA. Of us, I took a picture with them on the on their first tour bus when they were leaving on that first tour when they played the That's club. Cool. <laughs> They're all so young. Like Brandon looks so young and stuff. And uh, you know, it's just uh, I, I'm so proud of proud of them. What a you know what a great career they've had and what a huge success that they became. That's amazing, man. Do you remember working on Smile Like You Mean It? I did work on Smile Smile Like You Mean It. I know that's my mix on Hot Fuss on that one. Okay. Um, I don't remember. I mean, I love the tune. That song just came to, it's one of those ones that just came together. I don't remember mm -hmm. any big changes in that one off the top of my head. I could be wrong, you know. Maybe there was like some huge controversy that I blacked <laughs> out of my mind. That's funny. Uh, no fist fights or anything. Um, but, uh, I mean, I love that song from the beginning. Um, I know it was one of my that's my one of my wife's favorite songs. She's a huge fan of that one, and that was that's definitely my version on the record. That's cool. On that one, when you were doing the mixes, were the songs already all recorded, or were you doing the mixes simultaneously while things are being tracked? Some of them I was doing mixes while stuff was being while other songs were being tracked. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I, it, there was an overlap in that. In general, what does your experience with the Killers mean for you personally? Just, uh, you know, it's just another one of those. I, you know, I have, I have a lot of memories of bands and people I've got, you know, you know, first time working with Fleetwood Mac or mm -hmm. this or that, you know, or Imagine Dragon, you know, then they're like, there's one of those memories, like, you know, I just pinch myself sometimes, like, after 50 something years, people are still paying me to to, to hang cool. out with, with, the, with these kind of people and make music. I just like, you know, so it's just, a, just another great memory on the shelf of, of uh, you know, a fun time in my life and, uh, and a record that affected a lot of people. And again, those are the reasons I really do this. That's awesome. You know, I, I get paid to have fun and, and, <laughs> And, and make people happy sometimes, you know? That's so cool. 
my wife and I actually actually asked my wife. We were we were at a party with the band in Las Vegas. One of those dumping suite. I forget which hotel it was. It was like one of those twenty five thousand square foot suites or something. Okay, cool. Party. And that's where I actually got engaged to my wife. We were oh, awesome, man! There. <laughs> So we got it. so we we have some kind of history connected with the band, you know. After the record as well, that's really cool. So you proposed to your wife at a killer's party, basically. I I did. That's <laughs> awesome, man. Was Mister? I would hope Mister Brightside wasn't playing in the background for that moment because that would be a little it bit. Was, it wasn't playing at the time. <laughs> I, um, so yeah, that was uh, that was interesting. I'm not sure why it, it came to me at that point at this at this party, but we were we were having fun. We were you know. With the band, and when the, the two of us were sitting on the couch, just kind of hanging out, you know, it's, it's, you're in this big suite with has had a creek that goes to kind of like a little creek that goes through the suite and then goes into a swimming pool that that was that's all glass on the bottom and it's out hangs out actually hangs out over the strip, you know, so it was kind of, you know, enjoying the success or something of this and. And uh, yeah, so we got engaged. That's awesome, man. So, did you have your ring with you, or was it spontaneous? It was spontaneous. I didn't have a ring with me. <laughs> I probably should have thought that through a little better. Hey, no, man, it's cool. It's, it makes for a great story. Mr. Brightside is one of the biggest songs of the 21st century and the breakout track from The Killers. It was released on September 29, 2003 as the lead single from the band's debut album Hot Fuss. And as a matter of fact, Mr. Brightside was the first song The Killers wrote during their first ever jam session. Dave Kuning, the band's lead guitarist, once recalled the following. Brendan came over with his keyboard and we started going through song ideas straight away. Mr. Brightside was the first song we wrote together and remains the only song that we've played at every single Killers show. The Killers were formed in 2001 by Dave Kooning and vocalist Brendan Flowers. That year, Dave Kooning had posted a Musician's Wanted ad in a Las Vegas newspaper, which Brendan Flowers responded to. And the rest is history. Now, in terms of the story behind Mr. Brightside, I want to read to you the following from Brendan Flowers. We must have written it around the end of 2001. Dave and I were writing a ton of songs at the time, trying to figure out what it was that made us tick. I remember us going into the Virgin Mega Store to buy the Strokes album, Is This It, on the day it came out. And when we put it on in the car, that record just sounded so perfect. I got so depressed after that, we threw away everything. And the only song that made the cut and remained was Mr. Brightside. It came from this cassette of ideas that Dave gave me. And one of them was the Mr. Brightside riff. I was able to slap a chorus and some lyrics onto it, and I knew I liked it. But it wasn't until we first tried it out with a drummer that I knew it was special. We went to the guy's house and showed him the song, and I got the goosebumps after that. Lyrically, it's about an odd girlfriend of mine. All the emotions in the song are real. When I was writing the lyrics, my wounds from it were still fresh. I am Mr. Brightside. But I think that's the reason the song has persisted. Because it's real. People pick up on those things. And that goes all the way down to the production. We recorded it in a couple of hours, but it just sounds right, you know? Essentially, the lyrical inspiration for the song came from Brendan's experience of discovering he was being cheated on. Brendan was 19 at the time that this happened. I was asleep and I knew something was wrong. I have these instincts. I went to the Crown and Anchor, a restaurant in Las Vegas, and my girlfriend was there with another guy. Thankfully, Brendan was able to take that experience and not only turn it into something positive, but turn it into literally one of the biggest songs of the past two decades. Now, the first known recording of Mr. Brightside is from a demo the band recorded in November of 2001. The demo also featured three other songs, Desperate, Replaceable, and Under the Gun. Producer Jeff Saltzman was the lead producer on Hot Fuss, and Mark Needham was the lead mixer. The final studio version of Mr. Brightside was mixed in just 35 minutes. Mark Needham recalls the following. Mr. Brightside was the first song we produced, and I mixed that on an 8-input console with no automation in about 35 minutes. That's the mix that ended up on the record, even though I wanted to redo it. I knew the band was great and I was a big fan of them, but we got turned down by almost everybody in the industry in the US. So we ended up signing the band in the UK and then came back to the US. I felt the music was really good, but it's hard to know if it's going to be one of those, this thing is going to sell a million records. I was happy to see how successful it became because they were an exceptional band and had universally appealing songs. One of the big takeaways I get from that quote is that the Killers dealt with a lot of rejection in the US and ended up signing first in the UK. To this day, there is not a place where Mr. Brightside is more popular than in the United Kingdom. I'll be discussing that in a bit. The first time Mr. Brightside was performed live by the Killers was during an open mic night at a Las Vegas club called Cafe Roma. 
in 2001. As a matter of fact, this was the killer's first ever performance. However, the performance didn't go over so well. As Brendan recalls, Me and Dave played Cafe Roma in Vegas. It used to be a hip little place right across from UNLV, the University of Nevada, Las Vegas, where kids in black Converse could go drink coffee and smoke. There was an open mic, and we did Mr. Brightside and a song called Replaceable. It was terrible. Awful. Before we went on, I was looking for a place on the floor to get rid of whatever I'd eaten that day. I didn't throw up, but after my voice broke a couple of times, I decided that I'd just play keyboards because singing made me so nervous. By late 2002, the band's lineup consisted of Brendan Flowers, Dave Kuning, Mark Stormer, and Ronnie Benucci Jr. It was with this lineup that the band recorded Hot Fuss, and as a matter of fact, this lineup has remained unchanged since 2002. When Mr. Brightside was eventually released as a single, it didn't do phenomenally well. It wasn't nearly as popular initially as it ended up becoming. For that reason, Mr. Brightside is considered one of the biggest sleeper hits ever. A sleeper hit is a song that doesn't do exceedingly well during its initial release, but gains significant popularity after the fact. For instance, though Mr. Brightside was initially released as a single in 2003, it didn't chart on the Billboard Hot 100 until 2005, and its highest position on the chart was 10th. Now, of course, reaching the 10th spot is a huge accomplishment, but for a song as big as Mr. Brightside, it'd be fair to think it would have reached number one spot on either the Hot 100 or the Top 40s charts in the US. But in both cases, it only reached the 10 spot. It also peaked at the number 10 spot on the UK singles charts, though it did reach the number one spot on the UK indie charts. As big as Mr. Brightside is globally today, there's nowhere it remains bigger than the UK. Though it only peaked at number 10 on the UK singles chart, it's still out of the time of this recording on the UK singles chart. As a matter of fact, Mr. Brightside holds the record for most consecutive weeks on the UK singles chart, nearly 300 weeks in a row and counting. It's also in the top 15 most downloaded songs ever in the UK, and it was named the song of the decade for the 2010s by the UK-based radio stations XFM and Absolute Radio. It also made the song of the decade list for the 2010s in Pitchfork, Rolling Stone, BH1, and others. Despite having had initial difficulties in the US, Mr. Brightside remains the band's biggest hit in the United States, having sold over 3.5 million copies in the US alone. Now, considering how big Mr. Brightside is in the UK, it's fitting that there is actually an official UK music video for the song. The UK version of the song essentially features the band performing together while various images are occasionally superimposed over each other. Interestingly, it was actually filmed in the US on Staten Island. The second music video for Mr. Brightside is the one that most people are familiar with. The video was directed by Sophie Miller and is set in a burlesque club. The inspiration for this came from Moulin Rouge. In the music video, Brendan Flowers, the lead actress, Isabella Miko, and the antagonist of the video, Eric Roberts, are in the midst of a love triangle. Time has shown that the love triangle music video for Mr. Brightside is far more popular than the original UK version. At the time of this recording, the UK version of the music video has about 7.1 million views on the killer's YouTube channel, whereas the love triangle version has about 420 million views. The original demo version of Mr. Brightside is also available on the killer's official YouTube channel. I came across an article recently from a magazine called Las Vegas City Life, which used to be a newspaper in Southern Nevada. In this article, a review is given for the demo version of Mr. Brightside. So this article likely came out at some point in late 2001 or early 2002. Here's what it says. Normally, City Life doesn't review demos. They are merely rough tasters of an artist's sound and shouldn't be judged. However, the killers thankfully don't come across like any other band in town. The newbie act marries pop styles of British music with lo-fi fuzz of modern indie rock, which is to say these guys don't listen to radio or even very many local bands. This is exemplified in Mr. Brightside, the band's best and most popular song. It's energetic, new wave garage, a feel-good, strokes-esque anthem that ranks as one of the best local tracks in a long time, a sign of extremely promising things to come. In my opinion, if you really want to see how popular this song is and how much it resonates with people, take a look at some of the live performances of the song on YouTube. The crowds get so into it, they sing along to every lyric. I love seeing videos like that where the crowds are just as into it as the band and vice versa. 